Oh, the greatest trick in the book is this, dude. Like, I, I have it down with science. Let's say there's two little smoke shows sitting right there at the fucking table. Got my cell phone. And I'll just pan the room. And I'll just catch their face. And then I'll just wait and see the reaction. Because then when I put them on the story, all these dudes that are, like, hyper-obsessed with, like, what the fuck we do, they'll text these girls and be like, hey, you're sitting next to Bob, you're sitting next to Bob. And I'll be like, damn, I don't have to do anything. Wherever you guys are watching this show, I would truly appreciate it if you follow or subscribe. It helps a lot with the algorithm. It helps us get bigger and better guests, and it helps us grow the team. Truly means a lot. Thank you guys for supporting, and here's the episode. The man, the myth, the legend in the building today, Bob Manny. Interesting introduction. I don't know why you said the man, the myth, the legend. Well, what you're coming off a, a hot week, man. That was the, the most viral podcast I've ever seen, I think. It was a great quality podcast, because we hadn't been the same. Me and Kyle and Dana all have such an amazing chemistry behind the scenes and everything you saw in that podcast is exactly how it is behind the scenes so dana's always just grilling you kyle's oh, just sitting there yeah i mean dude yeah of course like and you can't really say anything against him because you can't because at the end of the day when you, you would do these podcast episodes and all that you got to be aware of like you know somewhat even though you don't give a fuck i don't give a fuck about much but your public image yeah and you can't really fucking badger the president of the UFC and talk shit to him because he's the president of the UFC. Yeah, what are you going to say to him? I got to take it on the chin. Yeah. I can throw a couple little jabs in here, but I'm going to get beat at the end of the day in that fucking argument because I'm not as successful and not as well off as he is. The only difference is Dana did not have any clue what he was talking about. And he didn't he, know the situation. He only knew Kyle's side, He is right? there to protect the boys, which is fine. I get along well with them. We yeah. dropped everything. The lawsuit's dropped. Everything's gone. I love Kyle. I always have. But at the end of the day, you fuck with me, I'm going to fucking let you know about it. You said on the show you didn't regret how you handled the situation. Do you still feel that way, or do you think it was your ego kicking in? Ego is always there, but at the end of the day, I think that I just know when there were some things that were off, and I'm going to let you hear about it. I'm not going to go, like, there's one guy you don't disrespect. It's been a guy who's been a great partner for you for a long time. Yeah. We're in a great place, which is awesome. I mean, Kyle and I went from not talking for six months to – you know, conversing every 15 minutes now. And so you're back, back on the pod officially? Yeah, I mean, my, my, my original deal, which I never really disclosed in the show, was, you know, six episodes. Um, I dropped the lawsuit. I ate the legal fees. I, I, I was the bigger man in a sense. I mean, if we had gone through the process of that, I mean, there's no doubt in my mind we would have won that claim. You were probably six figures in legal fees at that point, too. I'm, I'm down 200. Holy crap. So I'm in for 200,000. So Damn. I lost 200,000 with this whole thing. So when everybody says, like, you know, going to court, I'm going to sue you, I'm going to sue you, it, it never works. Kyle lost, I lost. And it was just a mess. But at the end of the day, why did I do it is because, I mean, I don't know. Look, it came full circle. So, I mean, who knows what would have happened. But I, it, was a, it was a part of just disrespect that was shown. And I told them that from the beginning. And uh, they didn't listen. And that's it. I mean, they, they, Kyle's a great partner. He's a great kid and all that. But they're little sharks. And, you know, there's one guy you don't fuck around with. And that's me when it comes yeah. to just, you know, especially if I'm offering the amount of value that I offered you. But at the end of the day, we're all good. And who was a majority of your anger towards? Because I've seen you bring up Shahidi. I don't the know. The problem was you didn't know. So it was always like, because they're smart. It's like anything else. When you deal with these 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 guys and whoever else, it's, they pass you on to somebody else and they pass it on to somebody else. Like, all right, well, hey, let's have this happy dad. By the way, Kyle claims that we got a uh, happy dad offer. That, that is furthest thing from the truth. There was no paperwork sent to us. Like they so offered Kyle, you, you were dead wrong on that. And I will say that uh, 100%. They offered us, there was never an offer uh, with paperwork involved. Okay. So it was that song and dance, kind of dancing around and whatnot, which is fine. Like at the end of the day, it's business. Like if they didn't feel they wanted me to be a part of Happy Dad, that's fucking fine. Mm. But just tell me straight up. Don't lead me along. Don't lead me along. Yeah. Because I'm not going to sit there and not take, you know, the 30% of ad revenue that I was guaranteed and allow Happy Dad to dance around the fucking screen when I could be making you know, money elsewhere for that 30% ad revenue. You know what I mean? But it was like, hey, talk to John. Well, John handles that. Well, Sammy handles that. Well, Kyle handles that. It was like this dance around. And then finally, I was just like, enough is enough. Sued them. Only sued one person in my life. It was them. And uh, it was more just to be like, yo, bro, like at the end of the day, just I'm not afraid of anything. I don't care how powerful you guys are. I don't care how many mm. fans you have. It's more about principle for me. I don't care how many people talk shit to me on the internet. I don't yeah. care about your fucking little fanboys and all that. I don't give a fuck. Like, you meet me, you know who I am, you know the kind of stand-up guy I am, you know I have those relationships because I'm a stand-up dude, I do my word. Are there times where I don't do my word and deliver? Yes. But at the end of the day, um, it'll happen eventually. It's just sometimes it takes a little bit of time when I give my word on something. 
Did that affect your relationships? Did a lot of people side with them during that whole of incident? Course. Shout out to the Science of Scaling podcast hosted by Mark Roberge. It's brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. Each week, Mark, founding CRO at HubSpot CRO and senior lecturer at Harvard Business School, interviews some of the most successful sales leaders in tech to learn the secrets, strategies, and tactics to scaling company growth. He recently had on the head of sales from OpenAI, and that was a very interesting episode on the future of AI. Listen to the science of scaling wherever you get your podcast today. Of course. Yeah, I mean, of course. I lost a lot of people. I mean, Damn. definitely a lot of people. Um, I mean, I went off the rails like the past couple of years. Like it was a very dark, dark time for me. So I went into a very dark place. It has nothing to do with my work ethic. It has nothing to do with anything that I fucking... Um, it was more just personal life stuff, and that's why I looked like I was a mess. So it looked like at that time that I was a mess because I lost Nelk. That had nothing to do with it. Oh, it really? It was a personal thing. Damn. So like, I didn't not work and do all the shit Dana claims because of that. I had personal stuff going on in life that I carried over to the internet because I just don't... like. I always, from when I started this thing, I always want to just always put whatever I can on the internet that's going on in the moment without fear of cancellation, without fear of judgment, without fear of anything. I want to show real shit as, as much as I can. Yeah, and I know you, you've gone through some personal battles. You used to be homeless, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I was sleeping in the back of a car uh, in L.A. Yeah, for, for I was caddy at Country Club, had a horrible cocaine addiction. Damn. Seven years I haven't done blow. I mean, I, I, you know the Adderall shit that I take once in a while and whatnot, which is actually the worst, just as bad. You know, Adderall's I mean? pretty bad. It's pretty bad. That's why everybody's always like, hey, I have ADHD. Should I be subscribed to Adderall? I'm like, you know, at the end of the day, probably not. The cons outweigh the pros. Yeah. But I've also done some of the most and accomplished some of the most amazing things that you can't even fucking fathom based on when I was taking Adderall. Can't deny so that. So it's kind of that, that, that fine in between. Um, but yeah. Have you tried microdosing mushrooms? I just recently did, bro. It's nice, right? Yeah, I, I, I did it in a real microdose way because my biggest fear is like, you know, I don't want to like see the devil and jump bad off trip. the fucking cliff yeah. and have a bad trip. But I definitely microdosed the other day and there was, I was happy. Uh, Willy Wonka was playing. I was in the hotel <laughs> room and I was dancing around, fucking all fucked up. And, yeah. You know, and then hopped on a plane here and here I am. You've been flying a lot, man. Boston, Vegas. You moved out here though, right? I moved out to Vegas. We're launching a casino. Uh, Monkey, Monkey Tilt. Tilt. Yeah, it's coming out. Um, international. So we'll be out in Vancouver. We'll be out in all these different countries and whatnot. And then in the U.S. in the States, we have a license um, for, I think, 20-something states, 22 states, where we'll be launching an exact replica of kind of prize picks model with nice. those prop wagers. And, you know, I look at it as when I sign that deal with them, you know, when you have me as a partner, I'm, you know, I'm going to make sure that shit goes, goes well. That's the biggest misconception is I'm a bad partner. You know, I'm all over the place, but at the same time, like, I, I, I'm very OCD on getting something done. And that's what my, my, one of my, my finest strengths is just the ability to just, I don't, I can't stop. I can't sleep until I fi finish something. Mm. What's your sleep schedule like right now? It's so inconsistent. I mean, last night I went to bed at 7 o'clock at night. <laughs> 7 o'clock at night, woke up at 3 in the morning, woke up. Was yeah. like, All right, fucking, we go to Red Rock. Went to Red Rock, met some chick at the casino, started playing fucking slots with her at like 4 in the morning, just me and her and nobody else. Tried to fuck her. Didn't work out. Usually I have a pretty good game when it comes to clothes and pussy. But it didn't work out last night. Did she know you? Mm -mm. Okay. So no. it's probably harder when the girl doesn't know about you. Yeah, but then what you'll do is, like, if she doesn't know about me, what I'll do is like kind of, like, I'll low-key let him know who I am. If it's not, like, you know, I'll let yeah. him know. Because it definitely plays to my advantage. Like, it increases my chance of getting pussy is if they know who I am. Yeah, I've seen you tag them on your story. That's a little trick you do, right? Yeah, I mean... Oh, the greatest trick in the book is this, dude. Like, I, I have it down with science. Like, say there's two little smoke shows sitting right there at the fucking table, and I'm sitting there by myself. I'll take out my cell phone, and I'll just pan the room, and I'll just catch their face. And I'll be like, here I am at catch, having a great time. Like, <laughs> fuck it. The story's irrelevant. Where I'm at eating is irrelevant. But the fact of the matter is I got their face in there. Yeah. And then I'll wait like five, ten minutes. You could do this too. And then I'll just wait and see their reaction, because then when I put them on the story, all these dudes that are like hyper-obsessed with like what the fuck we do, We'll text these girls and be like, hey, you're sitting next to Bob, you're sitting next to Bob. And I'll be like, damn. I don't have to do anything. You got that cool audience that just loves what you do. We have a very, very strong audience. Definitely a strong audience. And when Nelk and I are together, it's a powerhouse. So it's good to be back in, in business with those guys. It's exciting to see you back there, man. And you're bringing Harry Potter on the podcast. I got, I, you know, I've been trying, you know, Harry's tough to get to, man. And the only reason why we want Harry Potter is like, oh, it's a fascination with Harry Potter. It's, well, me and Kyle just have like an inside joke about Harry Potter and you know, a lot of the times when you do stuff, it's like when comedians say or whatever, like, I don't do shit to appease the general audience. I do shit uh, to just make myself laugh yeah. and to make, like, my, my inner circle laugh, and then hopefully it carries over. So Kyle and I always talk about, like, whenever we were going wild, we are on the road, we were running around, running around, like, 
our favorite times were sometimes we just post up with a chick in bed and we got a good night's sleep and a girl was next to us and we're watching fucking Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, there's nothing better. Right? That's a classic though, man. You know, and then I, I, hopefully after you, after you come, you bust the nut, you still like the girl. But that's, yeah. that's the hard part. That's very, that's very rare to find. I mean, you see how many times you are sleeping next to a girl or you're fucking a girl. Because I'm in a very like single phase right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's not a lot of people that I enjoy and they probably feel the same way. But after shit's done, being around, you know what I mean? Mm. So you're trying to date right now, but you can't find... No, I'm all business. I'm trying to fuck everything that moves. Oh, so you're still trying to fuck? Everything, yeah. I mean, why wouldn't I? I went through three years of, like, really committed into this thing that I was really committed to with, like, family. Like, I wanted to go a different direction. Like, I wanted to settle down. I yeah. came out of this life. I was trying to come out of this life of this fast-paced world of social media and all. Like, I, didn't, I don't give a fuck about any of this stuff. I wanted a normal life. Like, that's how I was raised. And so I tried to do that. That backfired huge. Trying to live a normal life? Yeah, I mean, of course. I was I mean, you were supposed to have a kid. Didn't happen. Supposed to fucking, you know, get married to this fucking bitch that fucking was just awful. Didn't happen. And so what it did, then I had a decision of like, okay, well, what the fuck am I going to do? Let's go back to war. Hmm. And that's where I'm at right now is going back to war mode where I'm the most deadly motherfucker there is on the planet when it comes to closing deals, getting shit done, introductions, people. Like, I'm very, I'm a savage when it comes to, I mean, I, I believe I'm one of the most connected people in the fucking world. And I'll put that against anybody else on the planet. You're probably one or two degrees away from almost anyone in the country. That's a... Sometimes it takes six. Sometimes it takes six, which is actually a very interesting thing, too. Like, when people are trying to get in contact with people, right? Like, I always say how easy it is to access somebody you're looking for based on the power of using social media. So, say, for instance, my mother was a huge fan of Susan Lucci. Mm-hmm. Susan Lucci was on this show fucking All My Children. Right? I mean, we sat out the president, we've done all this shit, right? Mm. Some fucking reason, Susan Lucci was the hardest fucking lady to even get in fucking contact with. Bro, I went through her like Gardner. Damn. So what I did is I went through her followers and saw, because if you think about it, right? You're trying to get in contact with somebody huge, right? Okay, well, you're going to go to their agent, you're going to go whatever. All right, that doesn't work. Well, guess what? You have access now with the internet to be able to look at who they follow. Mm. And there might be somebody who has like 700 followers. And it's like her gardener, but she Facts. just fucks with her. Yeah. And I'll just hit that motherfucking gardener up. Smart. You know what I mean? Wow. That's how I get to you. Yeah. If I need you. If that's a, that's a real desperate play, because I always try and play it. Like, I don't want to appear like a fucking crazy ass stalker or whatever, but at the end of the day, whatever it takes. Now, you might be a stalker because when I commented on Summer's photo, you DM'd me in a minute, bro. I did. You know what it is? I mean, I just was afraid that, like, I just don't. Anybody that fucks with somebody that is an enemy of mine. Mm. I I don't have a lot of enemies, and I do consider that a direct enemy. I didn't know that, to be honest. It's a, it's a female. It's like, oh, you're Bob, you're bashing a girl, all this stuff. It's like, you have no idea. I got to drop it. I got to let it go. But at the end of the day, I, uh, I just do not fuck with that person at all. And I just didn't know if you were doing an interview with her. Yeah. And it, by, by all means, please do it. No, that By was... all means, please do an interview with Summer. Summer, if you're listening, tell whatever the fuck you want about me and our relationship together. Please do. Please talk about it because you have nothing mm. to say. <laughs> wow. So there that, you go. I didn't know how, how much you hated her. And right? you also put a restraining order on me. Damn. That was not even real. And you admitted that in front of all my partners. And that's not okay to do, especially when I've done so much for you, had your back, and you fucking stabbed me in the back multiple times with multiple dudes. Yeah. Let's let's stop those little DMs. To people behind my back trying to fucking talk shit. Because if you want to talk shit, just sit on a fucking podcast show and sit down with him and talk to her. Talk to him. Mm. <laughs> That's basically it. She doesn't really go on pods, though. She's kind of no, low-key. She, right? How could she go on a pod? And, and talk? Because when I, I treated that girl amazing, did I run her through the fucking ringer when I found out she was backstabbing me with other dudes and shit? Fuck yeah. Who cheated first? Huh? Who cheated first? Oh, she cheated the whole entire way. The whole time. Yeah, she Damn. cheated first. And then also, you know, what I would do is like, she cheated, I just fucking retaliated. So I would just like... Revenge cheat. Yeah, just fucking revenge cheat. And then be like, we want to keep doing this? Like, we can do this all day. Yeah. But then got to a point where we are in a groove and I thought things were great. And it was just like, nah, you don't fucking go down to Fort Lauderdale and blow some fucking dude. And then you don't fuck somebody in my apartment. You don't, you don't do shit like that. So then you don't tell me you want to fucking... You don't want kids, and don't ever do that to somebody. You don't fuck with somebody's head like that. Like, I understand business and all that shit. When it comes to personal with kids and family, you don't fucking do that. Yeah. So. But I hope you have on the show. You should, because I'd love to hear her fucking talk about it, that's for sure, because she ain't got much. Damn. So, yeah, so, you yeah. were dealing with that, and you were dealing with the Nelk stuff, so I could see why you kind of just went. It was more that. Nelk didn't bother me. Oh, really? No. It was just more the fact of thinking I was having a child and having a family and 
go in that direction, then having that stripped from you is very tough and very difficult and haunts your mind every fucking day. I can't even, you know? Yeah. That's what that's what freaks me the fuck out is like, you don't commit to something like that at that degree and then fucking pull back on it. Yeah, and you ended up uh, going to rehab because of that too, right? I did go to rehab, yeah. I went to rehab for, for five days. Um, and it was, yeah, I mean, it was rehab for five days. And then I just realized, like, I don't really need rehab. Um but I needed a checkout. And, and so what I do now is I try and check out for certain amounts of time when I know that I'm getting a little bit like whatever. Because it comes from steps from my OCD. Hmm. Like the reason why sometimes I get banged up and all that shit is because life is so intense and so crazy and the shit that I'm trying to pull off on a daily basis is so nuts and the people I'm connecting with that sometimes it's okay to like, I blur my mind out a little bit because it's like if I do that shit like sober or anything, dude, you can say what you want. It's fucking, it's a, it's a, it's a roller coaster of shit. My life doesn't stop. And yeah. people don't even know what the fuck I do. I have like 20 businesses behind the scenes that nobody knows about. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I feel like you have really high expectations for yourself. I just look at executing the mission at hand every day. Like whatever my goals are for the day, let's execute them and not fail. That's it. I don't think too big. I don't think too whatever. Like I don't give a fuck what happens. I don't like, just as long as I execute the mission at hand every single day and work my ass off and get shit done, that's all I look forward to doing in life. I feel that. Did you learn that from Dana? Um, no, I learned that from, I think I just, I think I just, it naturally came from my past of just knowing what my potential was being 28 years old and being like sleeping in the back of a car and like carrying golf bags and being like, man, I'm worth so much more than what I am. How am I here? And then just having that motivation and not want to go back to that moment and knowing that it is very like moments away, like yeah. knowing that it can at any time you could, you could flop and have shit go south and just not wanting to go back there and that's what keeps you awake at night is just fucking that scary fucking thing of looking back to that day when I was in a car and the rock, rock bottom in LA and be like, I never want to fucking deal with this shit again. And that was at 26? I don't even know. My memory's awful, but it was around that time. Damn. It was around that time. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, I was so paranoid, bro. I was on, I took an accidental line of crystal meth. Jesus. Off the street, off the sky. You thought it was coke? I thought it was coke. I had a huge cocaine problem, like crazy. Seven years. I haven't touched that shit really. I mean, I've probably taken a line or two, like in between that, like, but like, n I don't have any desire to do cocaine or never will. Yeah. Even if it's like there and everybody's doing it, like, I won't touch it. But I can't say, I probably did like a line or two in like seven years. Wow. So you right? started it early, like high school, college. Yeah, dude, I was ripping bags, <laughs> like carrying golf bags for people, like so fucked up. Jeez. Like and they five, were still tipping you? Bro, I was the best caddy there ever was. <laughs> I was running around so fast and talking on my side of my face and going crazy but yeah so like you know just fucking i remember sitting in that car hallucinating off crystal meth I hadn't slept in three days this is my last day in la found a side of the road i had a flat tire this is my final final moments and then fucking had sleeping there with a blanket over my fucking neck chilling and then just hearing this noise these cars kept parking behind me parking behind me i'm like what the fuck's going on and i, I there was this prostitution ring being run right where I parked. Mm. These guys were coming, they were fucking these girls in the back of the car. And to this day, I don't know if this is real or fake, but I think it was real. Mm. I still don't know. Anyways, the sun came out, I was so paranoid, I saw shadows, I didn't know if these guys were trying to kill me because I was in the wrong place, wrong time. Because mm. at the end of the day, you don't want to be parked somewhere and be a witness to something like that, right? right? In my mind at that time. So right when the sun came up, I peeked around, nobody was there, I started my car, I had a flat tire, boom, 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 rolling down the road, fucking, Started drive, looked to my left, five cars came out following me. Mm. And I was like, holy shit. Pulled into CVS parking lot, mm. parked my car. The cars followed me into the parking lot, parked. I burst in CVS. I had a meltdown, set off all the alarms, went nuts and was like, hey, like, I need help. This guy's chasing me. Like, what the fuck? Like, cracked out of my fucking mind. From their perspective, they were probably looking at this guy as like fucking just cracked out and like whatever. And then the fire department, the ambulance came. Fire department's like, what's going on? I'm like, there's guys following me. I was just involved in something, but I don't like to talk. But I was there, just can you go look in that car? Because these guys are trying to kill me. And they went and looked in the car, and they came back, and they said, hey, there's nobody in the car. Mm. And I was like, oh, shit. All right, maybe I am fucked up. So I went to the hospital, checked in. They kicked me out after 15 minutes. You know, it was Los Angeles. They don't give a fuck. Yeah. You know, it's just a crackhead on the streets. Left the hospital, paranoid again, running down the streets. My buddy picks me up, puts me on a plane, and I go back to Boston. Damn. How long does crack last? I mean, it was like three days, I think it was. I think Holy it was three crap. days where I was, I was like fucking on that shit. It was a powerful ass. Whatever I did that day lasted. Like I was in the back of the car for two and a half days with a blanket over my face like this. So yeah. scared. 
Holy and shit. shit no, it's like, it was crazy, bro. And I think, I, to this day, I swear to God, I don't know if it was real or fake. You would wow. think it's fake, but I actually think it was real. That's what's fucked up. But there was nobody in that car. I know I sound crazy, but. That's nuts, man. Mm -hmm. Did your parents know you were kind of addicted at certain Yeah, points? they were very supportive. They've always been supportive of everything I've always done. Nice. So, like, I mean, I definitely, they, they, they were the first ones we called. My buddy, my buddy called him and was like, Bob's not okay. He's got to go home. Mm. And my brother and sister booked the flight, and I went back to Boston and then had success really shortly thereafter after I arrived. Um, ended up going to this music video shoot and uh, turning on this voice that I always did, which is a broadcaster voice, which actually made me viral on the internet, was my voiceovers. That's how I found out about you. You know, which yep. I don't really do that often anymore, which I want to get back to, but we have so much stuff going on right now. Like, but I do want to get back to that stuff. But I want to do it in a real way. I don't want to just be like, yeah, tonight, do, you know, clips online and doing the voice and all that. Like, I don't want to do that. I want to do it in a cooler way. So that's what we're working on. That right was now. iconic, man. You blew up off those. But I was going like 25, 50,000 a day. Nuts, point. dude. It was it was insane how crazy. Like TikTok, for instance, I don't fucking even know how to use this thing. I got like 5.1 million on there and I just repurposed all my shit. Damn. So it just shows that the, I was the only guy doing like had a great voice and doing these comedic clips. Nobody else was doing it. Yeah. I don't think nobody else could do it because I had I chose... You know, I could have went and worked for, like, Fox. If I had gotten my career in a different way, mm -hmm. I could have probably been a sports commentator and all this stuff. But I look at it like, you know, am I really going to go? Like, who's the top earners? Joe Buck and Jim Nance. And, like, how long does it take to get there? Yeah. You got to go through, like, AAA baseball, fucking work your way up. Like, it just seemed like an easier path. And it also was a more comfortable path to be able to do whatever the fuck I wanted. And I, I made the right choice. You wouldn't be able to speak your mind on Fox, dude. I'd be fired within <laughs> two days. <laughs> Paul Pierce Fox. got fired. Signing off. Bob Manoray, see you all later. Yeah. We are fired. When Paul Pierce got fired for uh, playing poker with strippers, I was like, yeah, that's, you definitely wouldn't last, man. Which is like, why, why are you getting fired for playing with strippers? That's why the world's too soft. Yeah. Why? I mean, they're so corporate. I don't know if it affects their stock. What does corporate mean? Just because they have stocks. So like, oh, yeah, that's true. You know Public I mean? traded company. Yeah. And other stuff, yeah. I don't know. But now I see you getting into acting, man. You just got a big role in a movie, right? I might do another one with Tom Cruise coming up. I did a, I did a movie with uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, Conor McGregor, Post Malone. Damn. And uh, yeah, it's great. I'm probably in it for about ten minutes. I studied theater and actor, theater and acting growing up. I was obsessive with theater and acting. That's what I always wanted to do. Yeah. And the thing was that I fucking really didn't do that as much anymore because I started to make money and started to do what I was doing on the side and this shit. Mm -hmm. So I kind of lost the passion for that. But when I went back into that movie set, we went to the Dominican Republic. I it was I felt right at home again. And to be one on one acting like me and Jake have a great scene where I pull a gun on his head and try and kill him, and that doesn't really end up too well. <laughs> You said the scene got the most views or something? So when I sat down with the director, maybe Doug was lying because we're trying to get this thing go theatrical release. And unfortunately, it's going straight to Amazon. I don't think it has anything to do with the quality of the film. I think it's more just about they want to push streaming, yeah. which is fine. But obviously, a theatrical release is cool. Old school style because the whole theater aspect is dying. Of course, people don't go to the movies anymore, which is sad. Yeah. Um, and it definitely obviously benefits them if it's in theaters. But... Yeah, I mean, he called me and said, hey, Bob, like, we tested all the scenes with our pool of fucking people, mm -hmm. and the top scene that was rated the highest was you and Jake's scene. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Wow. Because I definitely fucked up. When I showed up, I didn't know my line. <laughs> <laughs> like, I showed up this huge-ass movie on Amazon, like, uh, didn't even know my lines. Bruh. And it was like, I looked around, I'm like, I am fucked. Yeah. I got Jake Gyllenhaal and I, and I don't know one line. So you improvised it? I started to. We had to do two days of it because of it. Um, and I'm usually prepared. I just wasn't at the time. Decided to go a little, a little heavy. Bender was happening. Went to the Dominican Republic, got a little wild, <laughs> and then showed up and didn't realize, fuck, I'm on a movie. And uh, but yeah, now it was good. We we went through about like 30 takes the first day. Didn't get it done. And the second day, I just got dialed in, and then took about 48 takes. But it was hard because I had to scream at the top of my lungs over and over again because I was in pain because something happens to me. And like you have to actually really, you know, you're with you're with Doug Lyman, who's a really fucking known director. Yeah. And you can't fuck around mm. with movies. And you're with Jay. You don't want to be, you know, you got to give it your all. So, like, even though you feel like an idiot and you've been a little rusty in the game, you got to feel the moment. Yeah. You got to really get into that shit when something happens. Like, you break your fucking hand. He breaks your fucking hand. You got to really feel it. You know what I mean? You got to get really into it. And that's what I try to do. So Nice, man. It was fun. I, I love it. I want to do more movies. Yeah, I'll keep an eye. That comes out in March, right? I think it's on Amazon Prime in March something. <clears throat> I think it's in March something. Yeah, I don't know the fucking date, but oh. I'm supposed to know the date. Uh, so you had a relationship with Steve during the whole time, right? Like you guys were still tight. Steve will do it. Yeah, always. That was the hard part. Is me and Steve were such great friends, and that's why it's like um, half the reason why I dropped the lawsuit was my relationship with Dana was being affected. And my relationship with Steve, I had no problems with anybody. I didn't even have a problem with Kyle. It was more, you know, John and Sammy, you know, and just kind of like and even Kyle. 
because Kyle was a decision maker the other day. He's no fool. He knew what he was doing. And so I had a problem with those three. Mm. And uh, but it just I I couldn't hang with Steve. I couldn't do shit with Steve because mm. if Steve fucked with me, they'd be like, "What the fuck are you doing? He's suing us." Right. You know. So. But yeah, we were very tight. We communicated a little bit behind the scenes, but never were able to do anything openly like the stream that we do, which is the greatest fucking thing in the world. Yeah, Watch you guys been crushing it, man. Bro, I love it. I mean, that's, I, I, I love it so much that, and there's no benefit for me. I don't make any money off of it. I don't really care. I just do it more for the art of it all, of how it should be. Like Dana and him and Steve just like as real as it gets playing for real money. Like there's no fake in this shit, bro. Everything you see on that stream is 100% real. He is playing with his own real money. I think eventually there'll be a time where casinos pay a residency. Yeah. Because I think this will pick up speed. They're bringing so much business to these casinos, man. Yeah, I think they're bringing a lot of business to casinos. And I think that, like, there's a lot of gaming laws that prohibit this, such activity that they do on those streams. Mm. And so they push the boundaries as far as they can. Oh, um, there's laws that they can't. Of course, yeah. I mean, if, for instance, alone, too, you know what's funny is, you know you can't restrict people from entering a gaming facility I mean, if, a gaming area i thought you could get banned you can get banned from a casino at yeah. any given time but you can't ever stop like say like dana's playing with steve you cannot as a casino you cannot be like hey guys you cannot come in here mm. so the everyday fan you want to find dana and steve go to red go to red rock you'll see him oh you could just walk you straight can walk off, right man. in and they can't do anything about it wow I didn't know that. They can't do anything about it. I mean, they can obviously, you know, be like, hey, can you step away and all that? But legally speaking, they're not allowed to restrict people from entering a gaming area. Dang. I wonder why they do that. I guess they want more people playing, right? Yeah, I don't know the, I don't know the logistics behind it. I'll talk, talk to a lawyer that, that understands that stuff. But I know that that's, that's the rules that you can't be like, hey, you can't come in here because Dana and Steve are playing. Like, you can't do that. Yeah. You know? You got Steve a million dollars cash the other day. How the hell did you no, do I that? Got him th I think it was two and a half or three million. Uh, overall with options included. I mean, he, he was playing dead in the mud, lost a million dollars, like, insane. And he's just my homie. So I was like, dude, like, I fuck with you heavy. I always have. Steve's hilarious. And so it's like, you know, what's the benefit for me? I'm like, yeah, I kind of look like the man, so I'll do it. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I'm going to go and get your million bucks back, Steve. Popped an Adderall and just went to war for 24 hours. Called this company. And said, he called multiple companies and said, hey, look, we're looking for a sponsor of the stream. Mm. So, like, because at the end of the day, Steve can't play with his own money. He's got to play with sponsored money. Mm. Or he, had, like, you know what I mean? He shouldn't be coming up there and playing with his own money. He's got a stream that has 25,000 active users. Yeah. He doesn't have a deal with the casino yet, but he's still playing with his own money. That can't happen. So, I wanted to find a way where I could put some dollars in his pocket. Mm -hmm. He still gets to collect them, but it's not his own money. That's smart. Because the problem is of why the stream is not going to be consistent and work well is because Steve. You're not going to win against a casino long term. Yeah, he you, might run out of money. If you run out of money, you're fucked. So that was my goal without any real, was just to keep the lights on. Yeah. And so that's why Dana gave me shit about, oh, you got to fucking pull him away from the table and all that. So I'm like, dude, I, first of all, I do. If you watch that stream, you understand that I do fucking pull Steve away and try and get him to. He's very hard to convince. He's going to do whatever the fuck he wants. But there are a couple of people he listens to. I'm one of them when it comes to pulling him back a little bit. And I've always been that guy. He lost. I brought him. They they came to sponsor the stream this company for hundred grand. And when they sat in the room, I told them to fly out, no exceptions. Got to fly here within four hours. They flew there, four hours, four Jeez. hours. I was like, get on the plane, let's go. Like we don't have time. I'm a good salesman, <laughs> you know. And so then I got him for two and a half million. Wow, that's nuts, man. And I went to Steven, so there you go. You gamble heavy too? I used to. I probably lost a million, two million dollars lifetime. So I don't Holy play as much anymore. Um, but I don't play like those guys. And I I, I did like closet gambling back poker. Not even poker, just like I played slots and did all that dumb shit. It's just like, you know, at the end of the day, we're launching our own casino, so it's better to be on the at that end of it. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, to tell everybody this, you're going to lose if you play with us. Like, you, you, the odds are against you. At least you're honest. Like, there's going to be people that fucking win, but your odds are against you if you play the casino. You know that. But, you know, if you're going to play anywhere, you play with us. That's yeah, it. long term. Seems like Dana White just wins, though. I haven't seen him lose. Well, Dana's strategy is amazing. That's what's good about it. See, the difference is this. Gamblers, the, it's like anything else. The longer you play, the more chance you have of losing. Yeah. Right? And when you have Dana's bankroll and Dana's credit line, like, it's it's hard to... That's why they don't like players like Dana. Because Dana can go in there, put 30 grand down. All right, loses. All right, 60 grand. R and Gale. And then just, you know. Yeah. Um, but he does the quick 30, 30 grand. Like, if he wins two hands, he's out. That's he'll, it? He'll stay for fucking four... I'd say Dana White's average time playing blackjack is less than three minutes on the daily. Wow. When he goes to places. He'll That's come impressive. in, snipe you for 60, 90K, and he is out. 
That's discipline, man. But if he's down fucking three, four million, he will not shut down. <laughs> he will fucking. You've keep... seen him go down that much? Oh, man. I've seen Dana in days where he's just battling. Jeez. And just, you know, like long hours, like 17 hours, 20 hours. <sighs> I mean, I wasn't there during the whole time because at that time it's just kind of like, you know, you got to respect it. If he's going to war and he's that down, you Leave step him alone. away. You, yeah. let him, you let him fucking be. Let him go to war by himself. But when when he's winning and everything's great and the environment's happy, it's fucking amazing. It's the yeah. greatest fucking place to be. The Red Rock Room is so fun. It's fucking awesome. I got to check it out. Now, you you got to come down and play with us sometimes. At least, it's dude, it's the best atmosphere ever, bro. The best atmosphere ever down there. Yeah, those streams are electric. Dana just said he's not going on any more shows. Do you think that was because of you? He told me prior, the podcast, so I don't know. that I asked him. I said, was the Howie Mandel thing fake? He never responded. So I know Howie very well. Howie's a good friend of mine, and I know Dana very well. I wouldn't put it past, put it past Howie to be like, hey, could you walk out of this interview? <laughs> I wouldn't put it past him, but at the same time, I also wouldn't put past Dana to walk out of an interview. So I'm not sure. I don't know the answer and if that was real or not. But at the end of the day, I did ask him. He didn't respond. But I do remember talking to Dana Pryor and Dana saying, hey, you know what, dude? I can't. I'm not doing any more fucking podcasts. Yeah. So he told me that even before this happened. He's sick of them. So, you know, but he's going to do it for Kyle. He's going to do it for them. He understands what he understands how our head in the UFC benefits with the Nelk relationship. He understands how big that audience is. Yeah. You know, even with me and stuff like that. He understands our fucking, you know, Dana's smart, but he's very, very cutthroat. He will let you know how it is. And that's why Dana White is my favorite. Favorite person on planet Earth. It's honesty, but it's it's like in a good way. It's not like he's just attacking you for no reason. He cares about you. Yeah, I mean, I think he cares about me. I just don't think he gives a fuck. And he just finds me funny. And I think that we just have a great relationship and he knows that I can benefit his business. Yeah. If I get my shit together, which I have together, which he doesn't realize, like, we're good. Uh, but I think that, uh, yeah, he does. Dana has a soft spot for me. And I think that uh, he's he's the greatest fucking dude I've ever met in my life. Yeah. By far, there's nobody better than Dana White. I mean, you connected him with Nelk. Those guys have done him big things together. So I did. They won't let you know that, though. Yeah, <laughs> I saw that, actually. Dana will be like, oh, my son was uh, beating off to Kyle uh, in the <laughs> videos and all that shit. Rah, rah, rah. I'm like, bro, you have no fucking idea. I brought you and dropped them off like on a school bus and not <laughs> and fucking made that shit happen. Has he ever offered you a piece of Howlerhead? No, uh, but he's definitely been transparent about if I support Howlerhead, there'll be a cash deal. In place nice and so like i don't give a fuck dana's been so like dana will sometimes even small or whatever big money or whatever like dana will dana takes care of me yeah and uh you know i got his back for life on any venture he does you know including power slap which i think the sport is brutal but i do think it has potential um and yeah so we helped him a little bit with that gaming app we got a bunch of downloads on that app and everything like that but yeah, I'll, I'll support anything that dude does because he's Love been it. there for me through thick and thin. If you could power slap anyone in the world, who would you power slap? Well, I'd never lay hands on a girl. <laughs> so that's out. But I would probably... Hmm, I don't really have a lot of enemies. Really? I don't really not like a lot of, yeah, I don't really have a lot of enemies. I have people that don't fuck with me and I don't know why. Are you interested in coming on the Digital Social Hour podcast as a guest? We'll click the application link below in the description of this video. We are always looking for cool stories, cool entrepreneurs to talk to about business and life. Click the application link below, and here's the episode, guys. But um, if I could power slap anybody, there really isn't anybody I'd power slap. I'd fight anybody. Like okay. all that boxing shit and all the bare knuckle stuff. I would you would do that? that? Oh, oh, my God. Immediately. I would Damn. love to do that. That's something I want to do. I would love to fight somebody. Um, I would watch you fight Bradley Martin. Maybe Bradley couldn't have it. I couldn't even come near Bradley. Bradley would murder <laughs> me in a fucking second. I would go into the fight. No, like I, I'd fight Steiny. Well, you're like of, 50 more pounds than him, right? Yeah, I'm 170, and I would just fight him. With no training, <laughs> I would just fight him. I, I would fight that. Steiny immediately. If I, Steiny wants to fight me on any fucking platform. Yeah, any given time it doesn't have to be a platform. I'll fight him, but I love him. So there's no jealousy with his come up. Oh no way! Because people mean, say that online. Yeah, no. I mean, I don't. First of all, I don't read anything. Like you'll never find me in a comment section reading. Oh, shit. you don't respond to anything. I don't. I mean, I, I don't have time. A and B. I just don't care. I used to care. I used to be always like, oh, like I just don't give a fuck anymore. I've been yeah. in this game for fucking ten years. Like you know, I've known. I've been at the top, the bottom. Like and like, I put my life on the line with all my shit, dumb shit I say. Like I don't give a fuck. There's no winning to responding to hate comments. I respond to hate comments. In a couple ways. If it's just pure, you're being fucking retarded. That's not a nice word, but at the end of the day, if you're just being fucking retarded, I will fucking block you immediately. And what does that look like when you like, say that? Like, 
you're such a clown. You don't do anything with your life. You're a fucking loser. Like if I, you say something like that to me, I'm just like, okay, I know that's not true. You oh, uh, you know, I'm out. Yeah. Goodbye. I'll block you. If it's something like, hey, Bob, look, I think that you should slow down here in this area, and I think you should do this in this area, and I think you could add value in this area, but you're struggling here in this That's constructive criticism. So then I'll respond to that and I'll have a conversation with the person. I'll actually pick their brains because I, I do realize that these people are people that watch my every move mm. and even somewhat know me better than myself. Mm. So I'll, I'll look at it that way. If it's constructive criticism, I will take that. Yeah. And I'll have a conversation. I'll say, what do you think I can do better? I'll have it randomly with a fucking 19 year old fucking kid in the middle of fucking Iowa. I'll have that conversation with people sometimes in DMs. Mm. But if you're just if you're just blowing smoke and not putting anything behind it, facts or anything like that, like I'm just out. I, I don't love. care anymore. But in the beginning, I didn't. I, I wanted to keep every follower. I was so paranoid about losing a follower. But now it's gotten to the point where it doesn't really matter anymore. Yeah, I think people are more open. Like people are even posting like political stuff now. Yeah, um, I don't really get in the politics game. You don't. You don't think it's worth it. I just don't really. I mean, I don't know enough. I'm not smart enough to really sit there. Like we had Trump. We sat down with Trump. It was like. I remember going to that interview. First of all, we smoked weed before. It's Steve, <laughs> Steve looks at me and is like, hey, you want to smoke a blunt? I'm like, God almighty, That's fuck it, let's go. Like, what else? I mean, if there is one moment to go kind of viral and hilarious and have something, panic attack on the air, yeah. it's with the president. It'd be Were you hilarious. freaking out before, like super nervous? Um, no, it was just business per usual. Okay. I never get nervous. I never really get nervous uh, in interviews ever. In the beginning, I did. But like anything else, what comes is anybody that's watching this and... You know, and you're going to find a stage in your life where you're extremely shit in your pants or whatever. We got to push through that because once you start to gain the confidence and you start to produce results, that shit goes away. And then it becomes really fun and exciting and all that fear goes away. Yeah. So in the beginning stage, there was fear, but now there's not any fear anymore. It's just more just like dialed in. Let's execute a mission and just crush it. I love that. And the Nelk audience is super honest. I remember the first few episodes you were on, you were getting some heat. You were getting some heat in the comments, but you, I don't know if you read them, but I guess you got a lot better. At that time I did. Yeah, I, I read it. I read, I, I knew the overall, like, but the thing is this, I'm so confident in my way to sway people because I know at the end of the day, I am a good dude. I know at the end of the day, I am funny. I know at the end of the day, I do add massive value to that show. So I knew at the end of the day, like, you can talk all the shit you want, like, just yeah. watch because I'm going to produce results for you guys and make the shows more entertaining. That's just going to, I, I, it's like anything else. Like I leave it hypothetically compared to an athlete. Like I just leave it all in the field. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. By the end of your run there, you were, everyone loved you, dude. Yeah. We, cool had, a, we had a good run. And then obviously you, when you call out and you go out and say, fuck you, Kyle, where's my fucking money? Cocksucker. Fuck you, Shahidi and all that. You have to understand that people have to choose a side. Yeah. And so that was the tough part is knowing that I was going to have millions of people fucking crush me mm -hmm. and everything I've ever done is going to come out or anything I've done, like, and people are start talking shit and this stuff and this because they all fucking hate me because they blow those guys. You know? I did not see many people side with you. Uh, I'd say a majority still don't. Yeah, it was uh, pretty wild. I've never seen such a one-sided you know like, public know, battle. You know what we do? We just show results. I mean, we produced a great episode with Dana. Whether or not I was a punching bag and I got shit talk, like, we got 3.6 million right now on that, on that show. Their and the clips their last, got. Their last fucking eight shows, 1.2 million, 1.1 $1 .1 yeah. million, whatever. We got 3.6. Man, that's not counting the clips, bro. The clips got tens clips of millions. Went nuts on TikTok and everything like that. I knew yeah. that. I knew, knew going in that room. And I know that every show I'm on with Full Send will be fucking amazing. And I know that because I'm so OCD. I'm so dialed. And I'm so want to appease people because I am a people pleaser at the end of the day. I want to make people happy. I don't care about the money. I don't care about the fame. I don't give a fuck about any of that shit. Um, Pussy, yes, I care about it. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I just want to build the greatest product. Yeah. I want to create a great movie for people to watch. And that's what my goal is every time I go and step in and sit in the room with those guys. Nice. Were the pods getting more views when you were on? Um, tough, unfair thing to say. Yes, they were. Uh, in their defense, uh, it was the beginning of the show. I think that me and Kyle were running in an operation that was so good. Mm -hmm. I think that he's lost that a little because he's not as motivated. Because he's got so many things going on, but you, you know, the guy like Kyle, that's why we were good for each other. Is Kyle would call me and be like, "Hey, Bob, slow down the fucking going crazy and like, mm -hmm. let's dial it in." And I'd call him, and be like, "We gotta get this guy. Let's go." Mm -hmm. So we 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 do that one two punch. That's why we were so fucking deadly. That's why we had that run for a while. Yeah, with everybody great. Um, like now they got these guys like John Summits and fucking on there. It's like I don't know fucking who these guys are. Yeah. Like, I don't know, that guy also talks shit once to me. I'm like, bro. John Summit, is he an artist? Yeah, he's like he's a DJ a or something. He ran his mouth on something. I guess his boy fucked my girl or something like that. Oh, and damn. He started running his mouth. It's like, bro, just, what are you doing? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't I don't know who that guy is. I don't really, he plays the DJ thing. I mean, I just, the guy talked shit once, and it was like, all right, bro. And then I try to reason with him. Like, he, he's like, oh, you're down bad or something. I'm like, buddy, who the fuck are you, first of all? Don't ever get involved in my business. I don't fucking know you, kid. Mm. 
And uh, second of all, like, stay in your lane, bub. <laughs> Trust me. Do you keep tabs on these people or you just let it go? I mean, I just don't fuck with that guy. Yeah. I mean, if you say something to me like that and then leave it at that and don't ever fuck with me like, hey, bro, like, we're good. Like, I don't fuck with you. Mm. Like, I don't fuck with you at all. Sorry. You're going to, like, run your mouth during a time where I was, like, in a place where, like, who, like, stop. Yeah. Like, I don't know, like, stop. He's he, probably just picking a side, though, right? He He's cool with them. And, I mean, I don't know. I would. Ne- it doesn't matter if you're picking a side. Just, like, stay in your lane, bro. Don't send me a message or whatever the fuck it is. Or maybe I sent, I don't know what happened. I think he dropped a comment or something, and I responded to him and, and said something to him. Yeah. But it's like, dude, just, like, there's no reason for you to even open your mouth. I feel that. <laughs> when you made that initial call out to Kyle on your IG story, were you sober or were you drunk or good question i'd say for the most part i you know i do like to party and like to have my fair share of cocktails i think that uh what i said that day i remember i was sitting in the steps of my ex-girlfriend's place when i made that video um and i stepped outside and i finally was just like fuck these guys i don't care i know it's gonna happen if i put this out there but i'm gonna do it Mm -hmm. and i just called them out and uh that's that Damn. I mean, I, would I, would I fucked up or not? I mean, I'd, yeah, I'd say for the most part, like, not fucked up, but definitely, n- like, stone cold sober, you're not going to find a lot with me. Yeah. Like, in a sense of, like, stone cold sober, like, I'm either going to be, like, a little bit sleep deprived sometime <laughs> and be, like, a little bit fucking have a couple cocktails and be like, you know, that's just the way I am. Yeah. Um, and that's how I'm going to continue to be. Until... So you're drinking daily right now? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I love cocktails, bro. I love having beers. I love ripping shots. I love, like... Yeah, I mean, am I like an alcoholic? Probably, like, yeah. Like, you're drinking daily, yeah. Are you getting drunk or are you just No, I don't get sipping? drunk. Okay. I so never get sipping. sloppy. I never get drunk. I always stay just like marine discipline. Like, well, that might be the but, Adderall too, though. But Yeah, but I don't take Adderall that much anymore. Okay. I don't take it that much anymore. Like, I definitely popped the pill before this. But at the end of the day, like, I don't take it that like I used to. Like, before it was nuts. Like, I was taking it. Like, bro, I took it. Remember, I was at rock bottom one point when I found out about all the kid shit, which I don't really want to get into. It's the one thing I want to talk about. But that's the... I took like 12 pills in one day. And now, Damn. Yeah, in one day. 12 Adderalls. Can you OD on those? Probably. Your fucking heart could probably explode. You take 12 fucking Adderalls in a fucking day. So you just follow your chest? Just... No, it, was just, it didn't really. It was just whatever, but I was in a dark, dark place. And that's when I decided to go to rehab wow. and check out. And uh, Chad and uh, from the Hopeaholics podcast and all that. Oh, that's my guy. Oh, I love yeah, Chad. Come on the show. such a fucking great dude. You went to his center? He called me. Nice. Chad and, uh, and, his, and his other boy uh, hit me up and were just like, bro, you need help. I was like, I know. So I went there and I checked out for five days. That was it. And then I came back and, and did my thing. And do I need help at the end of the day? Like maybe, but I'm I'm in a very content place. I'm in a very happy place. I'm in a good spot mentally right now for myself, you know, and it's a lot better than it was before. So I'm just going to keep riding with this and, you know, like, yeah, I'll try and cut down drinking and all that stuff, but I'm fine. Like, dude, there's nobody that works harder. There's nobody that operates at a higher level than I do. And, like, it may not show right away, but like I said, it's a, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So just be patient, like, and you guys will see. And whether it matters to you or not, you'll, you'll see what I'm doing. I love it. So you're pretty happy right now? You're in a good spot? I'm in a very good spot. I finally got that thing out of my head with the chick. I, I still fired off a little bit the other day because I do. I get, I get crazy sometimes. I mean, three years is three years, man. You can't just sit erase that you know three years with somebody you're with every day it's like anything else everybody's like oh you're a pussy whatever like you understand this you're with somebody every day for three years you love this person so much you really care about this person you give your all you're forgiving this person and it's like the they betray you at that level there's going to be a lot of confusing thoughts mm-hmm. there's gonna be a lot of animosity there's gonna be a lot of hate and you just gotta ride through it because everybody always tells me now people text me all the time as much shit's talked online i get thousands of dms on a week being like, hey, Bob, I just broke up with my girl. I just did all that stuff. And I'm like, nobody's going to tell you how to handle that situation. Yeah. You're going to have to ride through this and just have, like, my, my best advice is, like, you just fuck everything that moves. That's what I did. I don't know if that's the move, though. For me, it helped. So for me, it helped. Like, I just fucked a lot. Not fucked, but just I always had a girl around. Okay. Because my dangerous, most dangerous times were at that period of time when I lost my chick and, mm-hmm. like, you know, was when I had idle time alone, sitting there in bed. And my mind wasn't distracted. Mm. And my, it was hyper focused on her. Got it. So, so that's you were overthinking, why, overanalyzing. So that's why I substituted a girl to, to be with me, and you know. But that's temporary. But I needed temporary healing. Okay. In order to fucking fix the long term shit, I needed it because otherwise I would have sat there and just fucking not been in a bad, a good Gone place. Gone crazy. You know, and that's when I would have abused shit and done shit. You know what I mean? 
Wow. You know, that's why I like to have people. I don't I don't fuck with a lot of people in the sense of having a lot of people around. You know, I have a very small circle. I have a very small crew. Mm -hmm. And uh, any relationship I go into, I'm always a vault. And that's why I, I think they respect me. I think it's good to have a small circle, honestly. I know people try to make as many friends as possible. I don't believe in that. I have a lot of friends. I have a big circle of people that I fuck with. But at the end of the day, like, I... You, you have to know my rules. <laughs> my rules are, whatever the fuck happens... We're not doing anything illegal. We're not doing anything like that. But like, whatever happens in a room or a conversation we have, fucking stays there. Right. It doesn't fucking leave the room. Facts. If you respect that, I'm good. Like, I'm a vault. You can come to me and tell me you fucking murdered somebody, and I'm not talking. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I'm not talking, and that's why. <laughs> you know, I've seen some shit. I know some shit. I like. I don't talk about anything, and that's the way I ask for respect back. And and the thing is, this it's like it sounds weird, like. Oh, yeah, I don't want to be talking. That sounds like automatically you're putting your hands up like you're in defense. It's like, no, I, yeah. it could be as simple as a conversation me you having and being like, you know, John and I had this conversation, blah, blah, blah. Like, I just don't want you talking about that mm -hmm. if I'm not in the room. Yeah. Don't mention my fucking name if I'm not in the fucking room. Unless it's in a good way. I mean, good or bad, just don't mention my fucking name. Yeah. Like, I mean, in the sense of like, just like, or if they ask you about how was it hanging with Bob or whatever, like, I just don't want, I want you to, first of all, Tell it exactly how it was, because anybody that fucking hangs with me or understands how they, like, I, it, I always am a host. No matter, like, I can go anywhere and get stuff that I want and all that. How I ever enter every situation is that I'm hosting the situation. Mm -hmm. I want to take care of you. I want to make you come into my world, and I want to make you a better person. And that's, yeah. that's the way I operate with anybody, whether it be if they're a guest in the podcast, whether whatever. Like, I don't care about, like, Nelk and them do clickbaity shit, right? Mm -hmm. Like, hey, like, so-and-so, they'll make misleading stuff to get views, which may be smart for business. Yeah. It's just not the way I operate. I don't, yeah. You know? I'm not a fan of gossip. I've actually fired so many people because they just run their mouths. And yeah. it's not because they suck at their work. They just, dude, people love running their mouths, man. Yeah, I mean, you just, you just get rid of those people real quick. Yeah. You know, and, and you just say kind of like, disappointed. <laughs> it's nuts, dude. They'll, they'll be such good rock stars in the business setting, but they just love talking. I don't know why. Yeah, I mean, it sells these days. I, I, don't, I don't like mind like, and I never mind if somebody like puts clickbait shit out on me because I don't care. I like mass amounts of views, all that stuff, whatever the fuck you're going to do, you can make this fucking clip tomorrow. I wouldn't judge you. Mm -hmm. You can make this clip tomorrow being like, Bob fucking fucks Summer in the ass and fucking die. Like, I, I wouldn't give a fuck. Yeah. But I just ask our personal stuff off the mics to be confidential. That makes sense. Now, you mentioned you had a lot of friends. How many of them were there for you in your lowest moments? Mm, a select few. A lot bailed out. Which I'll never forget. So those I don't consider friends is what I what I mean. You know what I mean? Yeah, I got about a handful of like, I'd say ten. Okay. Dane is definitely on that list. Nice. Um, so he was there for you, even though, because mm -hmm. he was siding with the Nelk Boys. Yeah, siding with the Nelk Boys, running his mouth, talking shit. But I knew what Dana was doing when Dana went out and talked that first episode and really trashed me and whatever. He he understands. He knows my capabilities, and he was motivating me. And that's it. He was he was running his mouth just to fucking motivate me. And I knew what he was doing. Mm. He sees my potential. He knows. And he had to wake me up. And you know what's funny? Dana White's fucking interview that fucking day when he trashed me woke me the fuck up. Wow. And he says the same fucking thing he does on that fucking message as he does every day when we text. Mm. Every day we're in communication, me and him. That's why. And he just doesn't. He just said it on the air in front of millions and didn't give a fuck. Now, yes, there was mutual. There was benefit to him siding with them for business reasons. But I have no issues with what Dana said or did because wow. because that's where our level of friendship is and whatnot is that, you know, I'm the, I come from, I got thick skin, bro. You say it how it is. If I'm fucking up, you let me know. I don't care how many people you tell. Mm. So you can put your ego to the side because a oh. lot of the comments I saw in that interview were like your ego and stuff. Because I came across as very defensive and protective and because I was getting ambushed on three on one, like, and also too, where I come from, bro, if you're going to press me, like, I'm going to let you fucking know, but I'm not going to sit there and get smacked around. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to let you hear it at the end of the day. I'm not afraid of any of you. <laughs> I feel that. I have zero fear of anybody in this fucking room. I don't care if you're the fucking president of the UFC, fucking monster, fucking media guy, or fucking fuckface to the left. I have no fear. I don't care. So you're taking your spot back. You're kicking Steiny out. Nah, Steiny's going to stay. Steiny's, <laughs> Steiny, Steiny's good because our banter's great. Like, I love Steiny banter. Steiny earned his chair. He weaseled his way in there, which I love because I taught him that. I taught Steiny the game. So when I hired Steiny, I met Steiny. With Kevin Conley, who was E from Entourage, who was my old partner, he came into uh, <laughs> he came into goal like a little scared little mouse, looking for a job, had nothing going for him, except daddy's money, and uh, 
I hired him, and he worked his fucking ass off. Wow. When you work for me, you know, it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You don't have, if you miss one fucking phone call, you're gone. Damn. That's you it. got high standards. If you don't fucking answer my call, and I call you anytime, my assistant, bye. So Sunday at 2 a.m. I mean, bro, any single time, like ever. I've sent 10 kids I've had work for me, I've sent home every single, like 10, 10 of them. Wow. So I had Brett, who was great. Brett now works for Nelk. I had Steiny, who now works for Nelk. I just hired a new kid who's been with a month who doesn't want to be disclosed, which I'll respect that, uh, his name. But he's, he's, he's doing it well. But, yeah, I run a very tight ship because I always look at like I'm an older guy. I'm 35 years old. So, like, these young kids come in. I want to teach them how to be better people, and I want to teach them, like, and I always say to them, like, you know, when you work for me, you best fucking do everything you can that benefits me. Yeah. But don't look at it as you're working for Bob forever. It's just look at it as you're coming in for a year, and then you use Bob to build your own world. Interesting. You know, that's the way I look at it. That's how yeah. I tell these guys, like, you have an opportunity where I'm going to connect you with some of the most powerful people. You're going to be around the room with the most powerful people, and you do everything I fucking say. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but I give you full power to call me off on shit, to always state how you feel, you know, about at any given time if I'm doing something. And I'm, but, but also, you got to be careful because I have a personality, too. If you get too fucking, try and impress me too much for, like, if I'm like, yo, bro, I need an Adderall. Give me an Adderall. He's like, hey, Bob, I don't think you should do that right now. I'm like, bro, get me a fucking Adderall. So you don't let them talk back? I let, they, you know, it depends. After, I mean, what month are we talking? I mean, month fucking one, two, three, not really. <laughs> but like five, six, yeah. seven, you can, you can run your mouth a little bit if you earn your keep. I'll listen to you. There's a reason why you're in the room with me is, is, is because you've earned your keep. So Did you see Steiny blowing up? I actually met him when he was Steve's assistant. And yeah. that was, was that before you or after you? Uh, after me, of after course. you, okay. Stani so that's remember, Donnie was nobody. Yeah, that's when yeah. I met him when he was kind of just starting out. Yeah, so the, the way that happens, he worked me for a year, and then what happens is you'll see a tendency of guys. This is why I like the one year plan for people that work, because you'll see these guys start to get inflated egos and get big heads, which yeah. is fine if you want to go put chains on and dance at a club with bottle service and all that stuff. That's on you, mm. right? But that, I just don't tolerate that around me, and your direct reflection of me if you're working for me. So what ends up happening is after these guys are working for you for a few months, they start to think of the fucking man. Mm. And you have to constantly remind them that you're not the fucking man and that you still have a lot of work to do and you execute a mission and not try and like flex. Because in my camp, we don't flex. If you want to go flex somewhere, go on another camp. Mm -hmm. You know? So Steiny, after a year, me and him were kind of on the outs because, you know, he started to flex and he started to get this like, you know, inflated ego, which I was fine with having that. But again... And he didn't listen much. He was still at the clubs and doing all this shit, which I didn't, you know. And so finally, he went. To, I dropped him off at Abu Dhabi. We all went to Abu Dhabi um, when I set up Nelk and, and Dana. We, we dropped him off. Two days in, I left. Stiney calls me. He said, hey, look, man, I got an opportunity. Because I always told him to shoot me direct no matter what. That's, yeah. that, you know, always just shoot me direct. He said, I got an opportunity to work with these guys. I said, well, what do you want to do? You want to work with them? He said, I just feel there's more opportunity here for me. Mm. I said, all right, I respect that. I said, okay, you're good. And that was it. And I have the phone. And then 30 minutes later went by. Well, we had a screaming match too. So you don't want him to leave at first? I didn't want him to leave. I was just, I want things to be done right. If you want to leave, you can leave. You can leave. But no, I, I, like I said, if you put in your time, you know, you can leave. But do it the right way. Do it old school, respectful. Face to face. Which he did. Which he did. He called me. And what I really like about Steve Will Do It is why I love the respect of this was Steve called me um, that day and said, hey, I, I want to hire Steiny but I'm not going to do it without your blessing. Mm. And that's all the care I care about. And I was like, dude, done. Wow. All yours. That's dope. And then he went and worked for them. But the respect was shown. That's why I love Steve so much. He's old school. He's a fucking good guy. And that's the way I try to operate my camp. And anybody that comes to my camp, which is very small, which consists of literally like one to five people, is, you know, we're low key. We're under the radar. We're not flexing with chains. We're not doing anything. We're just getting our job done and, you know, trying to, that's it. Do you keep it small because of trust issues or you just like it small? Um, I like it small because I just like to stay low key. Really? Yeah. I like to stay low key in a sense of like, I mean, I hang around people that like some of the shit I'm involved in and stuff like that requires complete trust and, and whatnot. And so when you let your circle get bigger, um, it can just kind of disrupt the way that others be worked so hard on your reputation mm. in an immediate circle can be disrupted because if you let too many people in. Interesting. So, so you I stay low-key, but I you... stay very, very low-key. Meaning I only have like one or two guys I fuck with in the sense of like that I bring with. Got you know, it. You're not going to see me roll. Like I, I came in here alone, which is like, you know, I got like 20 different businesses I'm doing right now that are like 
you know, I could have a bunch of people around all that. I just, I don't. I have my one right hand guy. That's it. Yeah. You don't roll, one guy. You don't roll 10, 20 deep like certain people. No, I'm not. I don't, that, I don't think there's a, no. I have one guy that's my right hand guy that will get everything done, whether it be folding clothes, organizing my shit, watching my back when it comes to if I'm in a room with like a chick or something like that, like, and like just to, you know, protect me and any of that stuff. That's, that's, that's who I roll with is just one guy. Yeah. When you left uh, Nelk podcast, is that when Bradley Martin became a co host or was that before? Yeah, I think that Kyle was faced with a s- interesting thing because Bob left and Bob was an entertainer on that show that was very good at what he did and funny, I think, and made some great stuff. And I think that he kind of got, I stuck him in the mud where it was like, all right, we don't really have another guy that can replace Bob in a sense. So mm. he had to figure out what to do. And I think he got Brad. And Brad's a great guy. I love Brad. And I think that he does a great job at hosting, and I think he'd be a great host for the podcast. I liked him on that show, dude. I think Brad's great. I was surprised they axed him because he was crushing it in my Well, opinion. it's not that they axed him either. There was probably, once again, there's always conflict in with those guys for some reason in certain areas, and there's always a little bickering once in a while and all that. So I think that's what happened, but I think that they resolved all that. And uh, I think that you know Brad will – they just probably didn't want to pay him. Yeah. I'm assuming they were just like, hey, Brad, we're really building your brand. We're not going to fucking pay you shit. Mm. You want to come on our fucking show? Great. We're not going to offer you a contract to do anything. You know what I mean? It was more just so like You want to uh, come on and wear raw gear and fucking do all that shit? It's going to be really great. Do that. We're not going to fucking pay you. And that probably set Brad off a little bit. Again, not sure of the situation. I can only worry about myself. That's what my, my, my assumption would be. Yeah. Um, and so then I think that probably Brad has his own show that's very successful, his own brand. Went to focus on that, but then realizes at the end of the day, hey, I really do need Kyle and them because they built such a massive thing. And so I still want to fuck with them. And now they're, that's where they are. It's pretty interesting. A lot of big shows actually have this falling out with the host. If you look at Impulsive, it's happened three times. And mm-hmm. then if you look at, oh, uh, there's this one other show with the rappers, Joe Budden, he got rid of his co-host. Mm-hmm. You know why? That's why, because you always want to control the money. Whoever's controlling the money is, is the powerful guy. So you always want to be the guy that controls the money. I think you, it's ego too. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's money. Uh, I don't ever see anybody leaving a show for like, oh, like other than money, right? Yeah, at the end of the day, you're right. It's, right? It is it's money. money. So it's about, you know, if you can control the money and then it's hard. Kyle's a tough job. I mean, Kyle is, you know, what I try to do was not what Kyle does. I, I try to do. I just couldn't do it was really build a really solid infrastructure around me. I think that's where the Shahidis came into play and really helped him Yeah, um, build infrastructure and take him to another level. And I like John and Sammy. I think they're really smart for a bunch of ball busting I do for them. They're really smart guys. Um, but it's hard to manage like a bunch of talent. It's really fucking hard. You yeah, know? they Every, manage it. You got to keep a lot of people happy, whether it be the guys cutting the clips, whether it be whatever. It's a tough job. And so Kyle doesn't like to be disrespected. And that's why our deal was a year and a half that it took to, you know, get figured out because we both did have big egos. Mm-hmm. We were both kind of right in a sense. We were both wrong in a sense. And so that's what took time to, to fucking to play out. I can't wait to see you guys together, man. You guys were one of the best shows back in the prime. Yeah, first we'll, be, few we'll be back. We're getting. I just talked to Key Glocks people. I want to get some. Rap yeah, what's going on with going. that? I mean, I, I I love like I I love rap music. I love rap. So Key Glocks, one of my, you know, Dirk. I love Dirk. I love Key Glock. And so I listen to that music a lot. So anytime I'm a real big fan of somebody, yeah, I fucking want to get you on the show. And then even if Kyle's like, oh, it's not that relevant. This guy's more important. This fucking TikToker or something like that. I'm like. Yeah, but it'll just blend better, and trust me, and he knows that. But we're right now, like, me and Kyle's deal is basically nothing. Like, we don't have a deal. It's well, not six episodes, like you said? I mean, it's six episodes, but also I don't give a fuck. I just did that more of, like, because he initially wanted to do one episode, just to have you back on the plan. I'm like, Kyle, I fucking built this thing. I'm eating these legal fees. I have you dead in the mud when it comes to our lawsuit. The reason why you're going to beat me is because you're going to countersue me for defamation, which I'm going to lose because I would have lost the countersuit. You would have lost for inter- defamation? Yeah, of course, because I went on the internet and was like, fuck you, suck my dick, fuck them, and all that. So I would have lost. So what ended up happening is I would have won our original claim, right? And then they would have countersued me, and I probably would have maybe lost more. And it would have taken years. And it would have taken years, stress. and it would have just been stress and this relationship fucking problem and all that stuff. But yeah. in my initial claim, I would have won. Wow. Which my initial claim was we want to be paid for advertisements 30% that were running on that show. Whether that be Happy Dad or whatever it was, a cell phone product, yeah. we still want our fucking money. That was a commercialized ad and whatever. Wasn't that the million you made, though? Uh, no. So when Kyle says I made $1.2 million, um, violating an NDA right now, probably, by the way. <laughs> I don't give a fuck. Um, the $1.2 million that I made was not from the podcast. That was a that was a misconception and misspoken on his end. It was uh, included in the Medicard. 
as well. Oh, the NFT. Okay. So I had a piece of their meta card as well. So, it, oh, it wasn't from the podcast then at all. There was, I, I, I think it was like, if I had to guess the exact numbers, I'd have to talk to my accountant and all that. But I'd say roughly we made just under a million dollars of the podcast. Okay. And which we should have though. I mean, it sounds like a big number when you have a successful show. Money's made. Yeah. Right. Sponsors are paying. But I'll tell you what they K. made. They made a lot, a lot more. Yeah. It was like, all right, hey, I'm getting thirty percent of this ad revenue, but now steak comes in. I don't even know the day. Is the steak deal the podcast or is it overall social? That's where they try to get tricky with me. Mm. Which which is fine, but I was like, guys, like I don't know what's going on. There was no transparency, and uh, and that's basically that. So basically, think about it like this, right? You sign a fuck. I own thirty percent of this fucking. Hi, we're putting this fucking ad uh, for tequila fucking <laughs> on the show, right? I have thirty percent of whatever this company pays for this, right? Yeah. Well, the problem is though, they can easily say, well, this deal, but this isn't just the podcast; it's our whole entire thing. So we kind of fucking can control what money we pay you mm. because now I don't know what the fuck they're paying for the podcast with this advertisement because now it's baked in this overall deal. Yeah. So that was the hard part too to also distinguish. Oh, so they wanted you to post on like your IG and stuff? No, they never asked me to do any of that shit. Um, they suggested it and pushed me to do it, but they never were forceful with that. They were good, respectful about that. Got it. They didn't give a fuck about that. But the Medicar we made, I'd say. That was a big launch, man. I think it was a big launch. And I think so far it was a huge fail. Really? Yeah, I mean, well. Didn't it make like 20 mil? Great. What about the people that bought it? And I love yeah. these guys. I think they're, and, and, I'm not, and I'm not saying this, I think that they they made $30 million and whatever it was, and then you're getting 10% of the resale and all that. I had 1.5% of the project, I think, or a little less. Yeah. Like nothing. Um, and I just think that NFTs are tough. You know, that it was a, it was a huge phase that happened, and 99% of them failed. Yeah. Um, I just think that they could have done i don't know it's hard for me to speak on i don't want to speak on it because i think they could have done a little bit more and i think they still are doing more yeah uh for it and there's no time expiration on it which benefits them and benefit you know what was the original intention of it though i think they originally promised that they're gonna open casinos and lounges and oh, cigar shit. lounges and all this Casino. stuff around it yeah um but i know they have the sofi stadium thing where they invite some meta card holders for i think that i did my job i mean i remember going gung-ho for the meta card i i, did I bought one What's uh? What's what's how how long did you flip it in? I did, I still have it. I haven't checked what they're. Did you check with the floor prices? Yeah, did it drop? I think it's down like ninety five percent. Oh shit! Well, We're, all my NFTs are. So right, but I even. could be wrong. Again, don't quote me on that. I don't know. But I know I know so far it's been a it's been a it's it's not been a miss because I do believe in Kyle long term. I believe in their whatever. But I just think that they need to pay a little more attention on uh, improving the. You know, there's, there's a lot of money that was made for those guys in that area. So I just think that, and I think they're going to do that. I had a good conversation with Kyle about it the other day. Nice. I mean, they have so many businesses. I mean, Happy Dad's got to be worth nine figures at this point. And they got the podcast, they got the YouTube. They're going to exit for a lot of money. They got the supplements. They got the full sense supplements, which is, eh. The Happy Dad's the big one. Yeah. Happy Dad's everywhere. Yeah. I mean, I think that that, that keeps Steve, you know, Steve and them are very in business together. But I think what really holds all them together in a real way is, is they're all really gung-ho and the happy dead and they're doing a great job with that i'm not involved in it at all so i can't speak on that but i think that they're i mean i, I do believe that they're doing a great job with happy dead love it dude it's been a blast getting uh getting to know your side of things man anything you want to close off with or promote no nothing monkey tilt sure is it launching soon launching soon yeah but we got to figure some things out as far as how i want to launch it on my end let, people can play. People can actively play in it. Um, you know, outside the U.S., there's restrictions, so pay attention. Make sure you read all the guidelines and all that. But we have a fully functioning casino that we're going to look to make improvements on a daily and and make it so U.S. residents can hopefully eventually play. I don't see it being immediate, but I think we're going to hyper-focus outside the country for a while. So. Oh, all right. Thanks for coming on, man. Love it. Yeah, thanks for watching, guys. See you next time. Amen.